Right. Good morning, Shehi campers. All right. I'm excited once again to be opening up God's Word with you this morning. Um, just to recap a little bit of what we did, of course, Monday we started out with the Gospel, Know It. On Tuesday and Wednesday, we did the Gospel, Live It. And then yesterday we did the Gospel, Share It. Um, so I just want to ask you a few questions just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page as we move forward to, the, to our talk today. First, do you know the Gospel and claim it as your own? Do you really know the Gospel and claim it as your own? Are you living it out? Are you living it out in your daily life? And are you sharing it? And these are questions I think we can all ask ourselves um, right now and as the day, day and week continues um, as we think about the, the messages we learned this, this week. So I'm excited to be opening up the Bible with you again and hearing what God has for us today. Um, we're going to be looking at the book of Acts again and moving back to chapter 2, looking from 40, verses 42 to verses 47. Um, I entitled the sermon, Better Together. A little bit why I did that was I thought about like everything that we did, talking about knowing it, living it, and sharing it, it's great. But sometimes we tend to think of our Christian lives as an individual kind of thing. It's all about me and God, which on one level, it is about me and God, but it's really about God and us as the church body. And so I call this Better Together. Um, and I want to think about how all of these aspects of the gospel that we talked about can be done better together in the church body um, as Christians doing it together here at camp and places such as that. So we're going to be reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to verse 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in the homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's open up in prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning with humility and thankfulness for all you have done for us, Lord. As we approach your word in the book of Acts, we ask that you illuminate our minds to what you want us to learn and how our lives could be changed as a result of our encounter with you, Lord, the living God. Lord, teach us, convict us, enliven us, and guide us to live for you with our entire selves, Lord. Amen. Okay. So think back, and this might be a little tricky, think back to Monday, August 21st, 2017. Does that ring a bell with anybody? August 21st, yes? yes. What was it? The yes, the solar eclipse. That's awesome. I would never have remembered that, but that's really good. Just about everybody in the United States that I know was, was watching, right? The big, big solar eclipse of 2017. Uh, like myself, um, or like many people like myself, watch the, watch the eclipse from the comfort of your own home. Maybe you're at school and they, 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 they brought a big screen so you could watch it. I don't, does, how did anyone do that at school? Kind of, did anyone actually get to watch it live from school, like go outside? All right, that, I didn't get to do that, but that was pretty cool. Other people, if you went outside, you had to get those eclipse glasses, right? That everybody was ordering online. That was pretty cool. And some people actually traveled. I know the pastor of my church traveled to North Carolina somewhere to be within the 70 mile band where they would get to see the total darkness. That was really cool too. I, like I said, I saw that on, on the computer. And there are a few people who just ignored the warnings altogether and just went with the retinal damage, right? And just looked at the sun and, and I don't know what happened actually from that. I don't know if that was actually happened or not. Um, but, the, but the result was pretty much for everybody who watched was an awe and a wonder. We were seeing something much bigger than ourselves that produced an awe and a wonder and an amazement of what God created. Am I right? That was an amazing thing that we got to witness there. And I think, the, I think the eclipse pretty much lived up to the hype that they talked about. It was a big deal and it was pretty cool to see. However, as we're, you might see where I'm going here, but as we move into the book of Acts, another event happened 2,000 years ago in the early church that caused people to be in awe and wonder as well. But this event 
had an even bigger after effect and it changed lives forever. Like the eclipse might have been an amazing thing to see and we might have been talking about it for a couple days, but most of us a couple years later don't actually remember what happened, except one of us, at least in this room. So that was pretty amazing. Um, but, we, but the thing that happened 2,000 years ago was that God establishing the church through the work of his son and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in the book of Acts that onlookers responded with wonder or even fear, and some would say awe, as they encountered the work of the Holy Spirit as he was sent into this world to, to work in our lives. So often we look back and see that and see those people as, just look at those early Christians, look what they did. But I want to remind us that these were normal people that were moved by the Holy Spirit. I don't want to elevate them above everybody else, like they were some kind of super Christians and perfect because they weren't. But I do think that these early churches' reaction to God's work, work that they saw should bring us back and remind us that we need to also be amazed and full of wonder and even fear, a godly kind of fear, as we look at the wonder, wonders of God and the gospel and what he's doing in our lives through the Holy Spirit. So this morning, let's start at verse 42, and we're going to stick in verse 42 for a couple minutes. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So over 2,000 years have passed since the church was born through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit of God at Pentecost. But in this list, we find four practices that need, that need to continue for a vibrant church life. For a vibrant Christian, for someone who's growing, these four practices are vital to our lives. And I want to start there. We're going to be looking at four of them right now. The apostles' teaching, the fellowship of believers, the breaking of bread, and prayer. And prayer. So let's start with the apostles' teaching. Christ-centered doctrine as taught by the apostles was central in the early church community. We need to hear the teaching of the Bible. So the early church didn't yet have the New Testament to explain all that we have at our fingertips today in our complete Bibles. However, they did have the teaching of the apostles who taught both them doctrine and how that doctrine would affect their daily living on a day-to-day -day basis. Now we have the Gospels and the epistles that do that. One important aspect of the message that these early followers would know, would need to know, is the centrality of Jesus in the Gospel. And we've spent four days already doing that, seeing how the Gospel is the central of every, everything that happens in the Christian's life not only for salvation, but for our sanctification as we grow day by day. So as the early believers were still Jews, they needed to realize that Jesus was that long-awaited Messiah that they'd been waiting for. Um, he was spoken about through the Old Testament um, and came to rescue us by his life, death, and resurrection from the dead. And I imagine that they would need to learn more theology and doctrine as time went on, but the apostles would start with the basic foundational things, and those were the things that they taught, the apostles' teaching, what the gospel was and what that would look like now that they had the Holy Spirit in their lives and apply those things. If you um, have seen the big picture of the Bible at any point, you know that in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people and he empowered them to do something for a task. Now in the New Testament at Pentecost, we see the Holy Spirit being poured out on believers, all believers. And so it's not like a specific thing for a specific task although we do have a specific task, but we now have the Holy Spirit living within you. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit and his power living within you. And that's pretty, pretty amazing and a reason to be in awe. It's not just for pastors and academic types to know the doctrine about God and the Holy Spirit in the church. Um, R.C. Sproul, one of my favorite theologians, said this, there's no such thing as a spirit-filled church that does not give itself continually and steadfastly to the study of sa sacred scripture. The first sign of a spirit-filled church is one in, the, in, one in which the spirit-filled people do not flee from the scriptures and seek a substitute for it, but are driven to it and have their spiritual lives rooted and grounded in the word of God. And so if we, as followers of Jesus, um, want to represent him well in the world and be in wonder and awe of what he's doing and be excited to be his representatives. We need to be in his word in a local church that's teaching that weekly and, and encouraging you to do it daily. The second practice we see is the fellowship of all believers. Um, 
Another aspect of the early apostles' teaching would be there to prepare the people to live together in community and fellowship together. Fellowship was vital. The Greek word used here was koinonia, which would be described in English as partnership, participation, or fellowship, the word that we use. Verse 44 describes fellowship by saying that all the believers were together and had everything in common. In other words, we might say today that they did life together. They were, they were together doing life together. <clears throat> Pastor and writer John Piper, who has encouraged me much over the years, said that, quote, there is a real sense of connection to, between, and for each other. So there's an interconnectedness to real, true Christian fellowship. Um, and that means that fellowship is more radical to Luke than sharing coffee and donuts. And as a side note, I want to have it on record that I really like coffee and donuts, so I'm not putting coffee and donuts down in any way at all. Um, I like Dunkin' Donuts is a good general place to start, but I also like in Lancaster we have Byler Donuts. They're like home, homemade ones, and they're awesome. Maple bacon. Has anyone ever had a maple bacon donut? It's delicious. It doesn't sound right, but it's really good. Okay, where was I? Okay, back from the tangent. Where am I? Okay, but I just want to point out that the fellowship is a much bigger deal than that. Uh, although it could be part of that, I mean, eating together, we're going to talk about it in a minute, is a huge part of fellowship. But fellowship is bigger than that, much bigger. It takes time, and fellowship costs something. It costs something. Sometimes we have to give something else up to make fellowship a priority in our lives. We have a list of things that we want to get done. I know that this week, everybody's on a schedule, right? Um, and it's important that you stick to that schedule because that's why you're here. But as you get back to life, sometimes our schedule needs to be tweaked a little bit to make fellowship happen. But fellowship is worth it. Back to the donuts, or not just donuts, but eating in general, the breaking of bread. So it's unclear whether the breaking of bread here is referring to the sharing of the Lord's Supper and communion, which is a much more serious time, or actually eating the meal together at someone's house. My thought that in this early church, in this passage referring to the early church, it's probably referring to both as a time of communion could come right after an evening spent with other believers. So many times the believers would gather together for teaching and spending time together over a meal and communion would happen um, after that in someone's home. Um, but I, I don't know about you, but I think that sharing life together and eating in someone's home is one of the best ways to get to know other people. Um, it makes sense that God's inspired word um, as recorded by Luke, would include instructions to have shared meals in the same list as, as hearing of having fellowship and reading his word and studying his word. It makes sense. Um, one application that pops up is the importance of eating meals together with other Christians to encourage each other. Um, it's not uncommon, right, to see two people meeting together. Um, and there, maybe you can see there, you walk into a coffee shop or a restaurant and see two believers together, maybe getting together and they're reading together or they're encouraging each other. It could be a discipleship relationship. It could be a mentoring relationship. It could just be an accountability relationship. Being, the difference being accountability is more like two, two Christians in the same life stage getting together to help each other um, stay on track. And maybe a mentoring relationship would be more like an older believer that you've asked to kind of build, speak into your life a little bit. And both of those are important to us. <clears throat> so breaking, bed with, breaking bread with other Christ followers. And next, I want to look at prayer. So the early church was traveling through uncharted territory, as we see in the book of Acts. Um, Luke includes prayer on this list because the community can, cannot be God-centered unless it's constantly seeking God and asking him what is the next thing to do for his good and for his glory. The early church would be people-centered would, would people without prayer. It's easy to get, become people-centered in, in our fellowship opportunities and even prayer. It's all about, like, what I can do for myself, which is that God wants us to come to him with our personal requests. But it's also important that we're God-centered in how we pray and what we do with our time together. A God-centeredness rather than a, a person, me-centeredness. Theologian Daryl Bach says this, a community of prayer is something Luke emphasizes about community life. It seeks God's direction and is dependent upon God because God's family of people do not work by feelings or intuition, but by actively submitting themselves to the Lord's direction. So this fourth essential activity of a healthy church community and for a individ healthy individual who's following him um, is foundational in that everything the church plans, thinks about, and participates in needs to be centered and, and bathed in prayer. Jesus relied on prayer um, to his Father when he walked on the earth, 
the, the apostles relied on prayer, the early Christians relied on prayer, and we as New Christian Testaments, New Christians, New Testament Christians, that's what it is, New Testament Christians need to make ourselves dependent on prayer. It's, we're so prone to go our own way and make it all about us. Prayer keeps us God-centered, and we need to do that. So, little life application here I have for you. Shahi campers, I encourage you to invest in the local church. Many of you probably are already a part of a church and very invested in it through your family. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what it means to be invested in a church body as our talk goes on. Um, but just a little reminder that Shehi is not the local church, and I'm sure that is every, all the faculty, and staff, and the counselors would want you to know that. It supplements the local church and is proclaiming the gospel each week and is here to help you integrate the gospel into every part of your life. But we also need a local church where we're committed to. And we'll get back to that soon. Okay, Acts chapter 2, we're going ver- to get started in verse 43 and go to 47a. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and joined the favor of all people. So in this section of the passage, we get to catch a glimpse of the four activities being lived out in a very practical way and in a very specific context or a unique situation in time. Okay? And that's also what we're doing. We are not Christ, early Christians living 2,000 years ago. We are believers living in 2019, and this may look slightly different for us, but it's no less important. So a few things to take note of as we look at the community. First, these lists that it gives us, um, these lists that we're reading aren't checklists to be crossed off. Yes, we should be obedient and faithful to commit in encountering Jesus to, with the Bible on a daily basis. But we can't produce fear or awe when reading the apostles' teaching, right? We can, we can commit to reading the Bible, and we can even do it and check it off a list, but we can't produce that fear and awe. That is the Holy Spirit speak, working with us through the Word. And so we need to be, that's where dependence upon prayer and the Holy Spirit come in, and a humility. We need God's Holy Spirit to make that happen. So it's simple, but at the same time, it's not simple, right? There's tension there, right? There's tension where it's simple, but it's not. Second, fellowshipping with believers, breaking bread, and prayer are also activities that Jesus' followers should be practicing. But even with these, motivation and realizing that the power comes from God is absolutely necessary. When we start taking these things into our own hands and making them lists to be checked off, um, they lose their power. So as we read these early lists of things the church did, um, let's, both, let's both look at the activities and the heart behind the activities to learn what our response should be. So I hope you've seen a theme with a lot of the things I've been speaking about this week. We've, you, we've gone over lists, we've talked about the gospel and what that should motivate us to do, but even along with that, it's always the heart and motivation behind those things, and that is where Jesus does the transforming at the heart level. It's only when we allow him to mold our hearts and renovate our hearts from the inside out that we're really able to please him with, with true obedience. So I'm going to go over a couple of these things again. Filled with awe and wonder. We mentioned that a couple times, so I'm going to look at it a couple more minutes. Um, the apostles' teaching would have included Christ-centered doctrine that connected Jesus to the long-awaited Messiah that the Jews had been anticipating. We said that. The signs and wonders would have authenticated the apostles as they taught the newly converted Jews. So a lot of these people would have looked at the apostles and said, where did you get your authority from? Well, a lot of the things they were doing um, on, through the Holy Spirit and representing Jesus would have kind of proved and authenticated, given them an authenticity and a realness to what they were doing. People would have known, yes, these guys are the real thing. What they're going to be writing in the future is the real thing. They're doing what God told them to do. So we are not newly converted Jewish Christians in the first century, right? We live in 2019. But I think our response to hearing the gospel of Jesus being proclaimed should be the same as those in the first century. So let's read the Bible, both the Old and the New, as it points to Jesus, right? And, look, and as, we look, as the Old Testament looks back at Jesus, and as we look forward to Jesus in the New Testament, it, with a healthy fear of who God is and excitement for what he wants to do in our lives through that. So we always look back and see we have a healthy fear because we see the power of what God can do. But also, 
an excitement for what he's going to do in our lives. So that's a, it's a wonderful mix in, to have in our lives. And as I think about that, it's convicting. It's convicting in our lives to know that I should really have a healthy fear and an excitement all at the same time. Okay, we're going to move now to um, the next couple things in the list. Sharing of possessions, selling property to meet needs, and meeting together in worship daily. Um, I'm placing these three things on the list kind of together um, and putting them in the larger care category of fellowship together, doing life together as Christians. Um, I think that most of us who have experienced this true Christian fellowship would agree that this interconnectedness that it brings true, it truly reflects an aspect of the gospel that cannot happen any other way. So us being better together and spending time together, um, it brings that interconnectedness more than any other part and reflects the, that part of the gospel more than anything else for both us and the onlooking world. Um, fellowship can't be checked off a list. Um, it's something that will look different and have different actions and different looks for every single situation. So whatever your context is, where you live, church bodies, small groups, um, with your family, with a group of people in your neighborhood, whatever that looks like, it's going to look a little bit different. Um, but I, but I want to challenge you that fellowship needs to be a part of your life. Um, even, even necessarily going to church on a daily basis doesn't mean investment in a local church. If you're investing in a local church, um, it may mean that you're going to be part of a Sunday school class or a small group or a youth ministry um, where you get to know people better on a deeper heart level, where, people can, where you can know people and you can be known by them. It might mean that you need to get involved in a discipleship or a mentoring relationship. And sometimes that can take a little bit of courage to ask someone older than you if they can help you with that. Like, man, that's not always easy because you're like, well, they probably don't have time. And maybe they don't want to do it. And it's true. Maybe the person doesn't have time, but that person could, they very well might say yes to you. And if they don't do it, they could probably refer you to somebody else. And so I, I'd really, if you haven't done that yet, I encourage you to take the risk and ask somebody to mentor you. And so when following these fellowship principles, for one of my professors at Cedarville, it meant that he was going to sell his larger home um, so that he'd have more resources to work in urban ministry. That, as a, I think it was 19-year-old, my sophomore year of college, I was amazed to know that somebody who had, had worked their way up and actually got to buy a house that they wanted and everything they wanted, now sold it so that they could live somewhere else at a cheaper rate so that they could, they could be more involved in urban ministry. And I think that was an awesome way of, being in, and of doing that, of showing what the early church looked like. Not what the early church, lo church looks like, what the church looks like now. So many times, even me saying that, I get so lost in thinking, oh, that just happened in the early church. But no, these same things were called to happen today, these radical things in our lives. Um, the important thing to remember here is that the sharing of possessions and sharing and selling of property was not happening through coercion. Nobody was saying, you better. The early apostles weren't going around from house to house saying, so where's your stuff? It wasn't like that at all. They were, people were willingly and joyfully giving up things so that people would have, have something they didn't have. So it's not a command to share all your possessions and sell your property, but it's a picture of deep fellowship and people who are willing to do anything for each other. And so at your stage in life, it probably doesn't mean selling your stuff. It probably means being radical in the way you're going to be for other people, how you're going to be there for somebody else, how you're going to be a friend, how you're going to be able to be self-sacrificial in your friendships to people, and even people that aren't your friends. So along with the list, they gather together for meals in homes, and they continually praise God and earn the respect of outsiders. So just like we talked about earlier, sharing life together while eating a meal is one of the best ways to get to know each other and reflect a unity among God's people. Think about it. How many Shehi friendships have started or gotten stronger or maybe just worked together better because you ate meals together? Eating three meals together is a huge part of that. And as you leave camp, remember that. Eating meals together is a big part of that. And as the fellowship around the table happened on a regular basis with glad hearts, outsiders, it said the outsiders took notice of what was happening. The way you treated each other, the way, the way you treat each other, and the way you care for each other, and the way the speech, your speech, and the even way you look at each other and attitudes makes a difference for the onlooking world. And I didn't say them, I'm talking about us as a group here at Shehi. The way people 
the way we eat together and the way we talk together makes a difference to onlookers, um, especially when you go home. These people loved each other, they supported each other, and they gave all the praise to God without taking the credit for how good they were. At the very least, if I was an onlooker, I'd want to know what was happening in that community. I would want to know what the big deal is, what's happening. I might not necessarily like say, oh, I'm ready to get saved. I made up my mind. But I would say, I, I have questions. And then, remember we talked about know it, live it, share it. As you're ready to share it, you're always ready to give an answer for the hope you have in Jesus. And that could be the perfect opportunity that you have as people see the friendships and the fellowship that you have together. So I have a question for you. How do you think people see us? And when I say us, I mean us as Christians, whether we're here or somewhere else at home. Are we witnessing to the onlooking world with the way that we interact with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Can people see Jesus in us by the way we treat each other? It's a challenging question. And finally, we come to one of the big outcomes of what God was doing in the early church and said God was adding to their numbers daily to the local church. God was adding to their numbers daily. So this community is effective in that it's a group of Christ followers that is growing numerically. And this is talking more of the local church for sure. Um, but here's an important truth to remember when reading this passage or passages like it all throughout the Bible. This is not a mechanical formula to bring church growth. So when pastors and people start thinking about this, this isn't like people growing by numbers doesn't necessarily mean that's God doing that. Doing that. And, it, and if people aren't growing, it doesn't mean God's not working in a community. So when you think of your local church, most of our churches aren't growing by leaps and bounds, but that doesn't mean that God's not as involved and as behind what's happening in your church as behind the church that has 5,000 people. It just doesn't mean that. God brings the growth of his Holy Spirit as people are called to himself. And genuine conversion only happens through God's powerful work. And that's the only way it happens. It never happens through, conversion never happens through co coercion. It only happens through God's Holy Spirit when someone's captured by God's word and someone, it becomes clear in someone's life that they need to follow the Lord. Most gospel faithful churches will experience seasons of growth and times when things just don't seem to be happening very quickly. Um, church growth is the, is the job of our sovereign Lord. And I'm speaking to this just because our passage went there. But as we think about our local churches, we need, to be, we need to remember that. Whether we're part of a large church, a small church, a tiny house church, um, the way it works is God brings the growth. We faithfully teach the word and we, we faithfully be the church as people and fellowship. And God does, brings the growth and does the growing. John Stott says this in talking about our passage this morning. He explains that the church, like the one in Acts, is one that is um, one that should strive to be a learning church, a loving church, a worshiping church, an evangelistic church. In other words, the church is a place of spiritual growth and spiritual praise, a place that is relational enough to meet needs, engage the culture, and share Christ. Um, God will be working in and through the church, so let's keep our eyes open to that work and be part of a church community that's doing it. Because that, like we talked about, we're better together when we're doing those kind of things. So as we're, as we're kind of running out of time here and coming to a closing, I just want to apply this in a couple ways. So to recap, what we saw in this passage was not a story of a church who found a list of helpful things they could do so they could attract a crowd. That's not the way we bring people to Christ, is it? That's not it at all. We see here in this passage a real-life glimpse of a church that encountered Jesus, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and faithfully followed and allowed God to work in his own way, in his own unique way. Yes, they regularly heard the apostles' teaching, they fellowshiped together, they ate together, and they prayed together. They wanted to do this, and they wanted to do it because they were in awe of God's work. And that's something we need to be ready to do. That's our motivation for us to obediently live for God. Let's be part of a local church, and let's obediently follow him in that context. So what does it mean to invest in a local church? And I have just a couple things here. As we come to a close here at Shehi. So I want, I want you to consider, and you might be doing this already, but this is just added encouragement, hopefully just really challenging you to do this and encouraging you to do it. And if you haven't, this can be convicting. First, choose one and attend it faithfully. Choose a local church and attend it faithfully. Most of you don't have a choice at this point in your life, most of you. 
Um, but remember this once you get to college or whatever's next after high school. It's so important to choose and attend a local church faithfully. Get involved. According to your life stage, of course. Okay? So right now, some of your primary things are school and obediently telling you what your parents want you to be involved in and some of the gifts that they're helping you to work towards. But get involved according to your, what you can do. See what you can give. Um, also remember this someday as you search for a church. It's not always what you can get from a church. You might look at five churches church hopping looking for the perfect one, but don't necessarily look at one that has everything that you want. Look for one that, yes, theologically and relationally has what you need, but also one that you can invest right back into. So right along with that, number three, remember that no church is perfect. So once you're checking one out, don't leave for the wrong reasons, meaning don't leave for unbiblical reasons when you're part of a church body. Um, there are reasons to leave, for, leave a church. That's when they are no longer proclaiming Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. A church that's me-centered and all about what we can do and um, the next experience. However, don't leave the church for the wrong reason, your local church. And ask God for guidance and help in this process. God wants you to be, to be involved in local church. He knows that we are better together. We are better together as we follow him. Um, we... We, want, we have this tendency to want to be Lone Ranger Christians and do it all on our own. But the truth is, is that God, through his word and the Holy Spirit and believers around us, can do much more work when we're involved in a church body and, and together represent him to a dark world. So it's been a pleasure to speak with you this week. I've, I've truly enjoyed it, and I pray for each of you as we talked about the gospel, knowing it, living it, and sharing it. I pray that each of you will have something to think about and that God will continue to challenge you with these words as um, the week goes on and whether you stay for a week, the next week or not. Um, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word that's been given to us to show us your holiness that convicts us of our sinful condition and displays the redemption from our sins that is offered through Jesus. Lord, we confess that we are driven so much of the time by our own glory. Lord, give us the strength to love you in the midst of a world that doesn't love you. I pray that we can be lights in a dark world and live our lives in such a way that brings you all the honor and glory. And I pray for each of, each of these campers, um, counselors, faculty, and staff, that in whatever realm of life that you have us in whatever context you've called us to, that we'll be able to love you and love our neighbors and show people what the gospel looks like because of that. In your name, amen. So I know that at the end of each, each sing time, you usually do a benediction. Um, the Lord bless you and keep you as you end the songs. But one of the things that happens at the end of church services in a lot of church traditions is a time of reciting a benediction that's meant to encourage and stimulate joy and commitment to, to Jesus. And so I want to leave you today, as we, before anyone comes to give announcements, I want to leave you with a benediction that kind of closes out the week that we've had together. So, though you do not see him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Therefore, shehi campers, counselors, faculty, and staff, as you follow Jesus in your everyday lives, at home and at school, know that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. As you face whatever comes in the weeks and months and year ahead, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen.